Next slide. And then that brings us to today. I'm going to introduce Alex in a moment, but first uh, I want to share something, uh, and that is that, that I'm personally situated on the Haldeman Track land that was granted to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River and are within the territory of the Neutral and Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge and philosophies of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening our country. So now let's turn to today's speaker. Alexander Mika Birdze is a professor of history and the Ruth Herring Noel, Noel Endowed Chair at Louisiana State University Shreveport. He holds a degree in international law from Tbilisi State University and a PhD in history from Florida State University. An expert on Napoleonic Wars, Dr. Mika Birdze has written and edited over two dozen books, including the multi-volume series on the Russian eyewitness accounts of the Napoleonic Wars and a trilogy on Napoleon's invasion. His latest book, The Napoleonic Wars, A Global History, was named amongst the best books of the year by Foreign Affairs Magazine and won the Society for Military History's Distinguished Book Award and the Gilder Lehrman Military History Prize. I might want to add that's the book I'm reading right now and, and thoroughly enjoying it. So Dr. Mika Birdsey is one of the editors of the multi-volume Cambridge History of the Napoleonic Wars. His latest book, Kutsov, A Life in War and Peace, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press in 2022. So we're thrilled to feature Alex today. Please join me in welcoming him. So Alex, all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, uh, replace quickly the slideshow and we will start. There we go. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Tom uh, and, and Chris, for inviting me to History Symposium. Uh, what a treat it is to be here. I want to thank uh, the audience for joining us today, especially those uh, members of the audience who attended my event now as they switch to this event <laughs> they get a double dose of me <laughs> so um that is uh, uh again uh, uh, i'm very grateful for it um what i wanted to do today is um kind of discuss um uh, in in very general terms uh the russian side of napoleon's invasion of, of russia in, in 1812 the decisive campaign which uh, which set in motion the process that resulted in the um, French Empire crumbling down within the span of just a year and a half. Um, and in particular, uh, I want to look at the figure of uh, the Russian Field Marshal Mikhail Galinishev Kutuzov. Um, it is the, this presentation is the uh, kind of the result of uh, uh, last few years uh, research, uh, which I dedicated to. Uh, to produce the book uh, for the Oxford University Press, uh, which, which is coming out uh, later uh, this summer. Um, standing on the hill overlooking the Neumann River, which marked the boundary of the Russian Empire, Emperor Napoleon watched as tens of thousands of troops from his Grand Armée marched across the pontoon bridges. It was June 24, 1812, a clear summer morning. Soldiers, Russia is swept away by her fate, Napoleon exhorted his troops in, in the proclamation. She places us between dishonor and war. The choice cannot be in doubt. Let us then march forward. Fresh from his triumph over the Ottoman Empire, uh, Field Marshal, well, he was not yet Field Marshal, but um, General Mikhail Galinisho Kutuzov was still at his estate in northern Ukraine when he received the news of the invasion. Over the previous two years, he had followed Napoleon's massive military preparations. Uh, despite having more than a quarter million troops tied down in Spain, the French emperor, as we all know, drew, up, uh, drew upon the resources of his vast empire and raised close to 600,000 men, not counting a veritable army of political officials, servants, attendant women, and so on and so on, for the, his new war in the East. 
Uh, the task of, of equipping, provisioning, moving such a multitude was colossal, requiring patience, money, organizational skill, all of which Napoleon amply possessed. Uh, by the late spring of 1812, the Grand Armée, therefore, had assembled along the Russia's western frontier in several groups and then crossed the Niemen River. Now, Emperor Alexander was then attending a ball at uh, General Levin Benningson's country manor near the city of Vilna, less than 60 miles from the crossing site. And uh, while at this ball, uh, the Russian Minister of Police approached the Emperor and whispered in his ear that the war had commenced. Now, the Tsar was not surprised by this news. Russian intelligence had given him ample warning. In fact, that's one of the kind of unheralded parts of the Napoleonic uh, history where we haven't paid uh, sufficient attention to intelligence uh, history and one of the great hallmarks, uh, actually one of the great triumphs really, of this time is the Russian ability to penetrate the French Ministry of Defense and secure significant uh, uh, number of uh, kind of information intelligence on the eve of the war. Um, uh, um, so Tsar knew that the war was coming uh, and he had, but uh, for this conflict, he could marshal only uh, 250,000 Russian soldiers uh, to confront this Napoleonic juggernaut, well over half a million men. Uh, and even these troops were scattered, as you can see on the map, uh, among three major armies and a handful of separate corps that had been mobilized. Of course, on the map, you see the first Western army, which is up at the top right here of about 120,000 men, commanded by General and Minister of War Mikhail Barclay de Toli, holding positions in the Lithuanian countryside surrounding Vilna, modern-day Vilnius. Further south, you can see the uh, blob of the Second Western Army under uh, my compatriot, uh, Georgian Prince Peter Bagration, whose units were spread out in what is today uh, Belarus. And further south, you see another kind of oval and that is General Alexander Tormasov, commanding the 3rd Reserve Army of Observation, which was gathered in what is today southwest Ukraine. Now, in addition to these three major armies, there were additional smaller corps, for example, Finland Corps, or uh, the uh, uh, Reserve Corps uh, in the second line, and most crucially, Admiral uh, Pavel Chichagov's uh, Army of the Danube, which was coming up from the south, uh, where, it, where they were fighting the... the Turks. <coughs> Apologies. Alexander, uh, Tsar Alexander, took the news of the French crossing uh, of the Niemen in stride, keeping it to himself until the dinner festivities were over. And then returning to his headquarters, he issued a proclamation condemning Napoleon, um, condemning this aggression, and urging his men, um, his, you know, the Russian people, to resist. And the proclamation read in parts, we are left with no other choice but to turn to arms and to appeal to the Almighty, the witness and the defender of the truth. The ancient blood of the valiant Slavs flows in your veins, the Tsar told his soldiers. Warriors, you must defend your faith, your country, your liberty. Behind this defined rhetoric, however, was the reality, and the reality was quite grim. The Russian armies were no match for the assault, and we can discuss during the Q&A, both Napoleonic, uh, uh, Napoleon's initial plan. Uh, I've given presentations and written actually extensively on the Vilna operation that Napoleon had in mind uh, for the opening of this war. Uh, but uh, more crucially, Russian armies simply could not contain the numerically superior uh, Napoleonic forces. Uh, but even more worrisome than the inferiority of, in numbers was the nebulousness of the Russian military strategy. Tsar Alexander routinely concealed military intelligence even from his senior generals and kept military planning contained within a very small circle of imperial advisors. Indeed, um, discussions were conducted in such secrecy that many senior Russian generals, including army commanders, remained completely unaware of what exactly was planned in the case of the war. For example, General Levin Benningson, who soon enough will be appointed the chief of staff of uh, of the Russian armies. Well, Benningson, uh, by the way, he was the host at that dinner event where uh, Alexander was told about the start of the war. Well, Benningson complained about his own exclusion from the military discussions, and he noted um, that, quote,
quote, Emperor Alexander did not show me any parts of the operational plan, uh, and, and I don't know any person who actually seen it. In the two years leading up to the war, plenty of ink had been spent in drafting various plans. Uh, we can, in fact, identify as many as uh, 34 memorandums, the strategic kind of planning memorandum, submitted by various officers. Every shade of opinion seems to have been represented among them, uh, but we can, I think, generally speaking, can group these memorandums into two categories. Um, one of them was the party of action, or if you are younger and you might have uh, seen, you know, if you, uh, if you like to game, you probably recognize the reference to Leroy Jenkins, and if not, you can uh, look it up on YouTube and, and have fun with it. But the party of Leroy Jenkins <laughs> was uh, confident uh, in the power of Russia co to contend with Napoleon and thought that the wisest policy to conduct uh, uh, was to conduct a so-called preventative war, that is to strike at the French before the French actually came. Uh, and a significant number of Russian officers supported that, including Peter Bagration, whom you see on the screen, and Alexander Württemberg, uh, who was relative of the Tsar, uh, who argued that um, the defensive strategy uh, gave the enemy the initiative, gave the enemy the ability to exploit the geography of Russia's western borderlands, where Napoleon could, again, deploy his superior forces, divide the Russian armies, and then defeat them in piecemeal. Bagration reflected the opinion of these hardline officers when he called for a more belligerent approach. Uh, he, pro for example, proposed establishing a, a red line, so that he called it the demarcation line, along the Ora River, uh, and its violation, quote, even by a single French battalion, unquote, uh, would be considered by Russia as a castle's belly, and then the Russian army was supposed to invade the Grand Duchy of Warsaw and even Prussian territory to incite national movements against the French, and most crucially, to shift the theater of war away from the Russian boundary, Russian territory, into the effectively enemy territory, right? Why despoil our land when we can bring the war to the enemy? The purpose of such a, a again, a preemptive uh, offensive was to uh, anticipate the attack and, and, and kind of shift the burden of the war onto the uh, enemy uh, uh, nation. Um, the party of action was, however, was overshadowed by the more cool-headed um, party of defense, or you can say um, kind of party of uh, uh, or Fabian approach. Uh, early plans for preemptive strikes into the Duchy of Warsaw and extending military uh, support to Prussia had been negated by both the size uh, of Russia, of French armies, but also by the fact that France was able to conclude an al uh, two alliances, one with Austria and one with Prussia, which meant that Russia couldn't hope for the support of these two crucial uh, countries. So the Russians, therefore, the more defensive-minded Russians, focused on, on, on different approach. One of the central arguments in these memorandums was a total avoidance of pitched battles with Napoleon. Now, this can be explained by a number of factors. Uh, first, for example, Russians paid close attention to what was happening in Spain, and we know that in 1810, 1811, right, Arthur Wellesley, uh, soon Duke of Wellington, conducted masterful defensive campaign in uh, Portugal, where he was able to construct uh, the defensive lines of Torres Vedras, retreat uh, behind them, and uh, defeat the uh, French invasion uh, led by the Marshal André Masséna, and then counterattack into Spain, leading to the great victory at Salamanca, capture of Madrid, and so on and so on, right? Uh, well, all these events uh, um, struck the imagination of Russian officers. Um, they, they followed these events closely, and they were convinced that this was, uh, that the, the, the only way really to prevail over Napoleon and Russia was through a similar methodical defensive war. Now, Russians are not the only ones who think this is the proper way to go forward. Uh, Prussian general and military reformer uh, Gerhard von Scharnhorst was also impressed by the uh, uh, Wellington strategy in the peninsula, and he urged the Tsar to follow it as well. 
Uh, the example of resistance in Spain, more, more popular resistance also that developed in Spain, um, also came uh, to notice, and uh, Russian officers uh, were um, hopeful that they will be able to incite a similar movement, both within Russia and, and maybe even beyond. Besides, um, there is, uh, you know, even if we live alone, the, the British experiences in Peninsula, we have to bear in mind that the Russians also have an uh, object less than much nearer home. I remind the listeners that uh, almost a century earlier, in 1709, right, a Swedish king, Charles XII, invaded Russia during the Great Northern War, and uh, Peter the Great was able to uh, essentially retreat uh, deep into Ukraine uh, and defeat him at Poltava. So there was, uh, again, uh, in a more recent experience that Russians also could rely on. Uh, furthermore, the general principle of avoiding decisive actions and making the enemy feel the full uh, effect of the great extent of the Russian territory uh, seems to have been taken for granted, uh, not just by Russians, but by many uh, contemporaries. Uh, Alexander Chernyshev, who was the head of the Russian intelligence uh, uh, outfit out in Paris and who uh, uh, was the man uh, to carry out that remarkably successful intelligence operation in Paris, which penetrated the French Defense Ministry. Well, uh, Chernyshev uh, wrote, for example, um, on the eve of the war, that the system of war that we should follow in this impending conflict is the one in which Fabius Cunctator, so here you see the kind of the, uh, the context of going back to the, uh, the great Punic Wars, right? Fabius Cunctator and Duke of Wellington offered the best example so. In fact, uh, in February of, uh, in late February of 1812, Chernyshev uh, wrote back home from Paris uh, uh, letters uh, describing conversations that he had with the French officers. And he notes in these letters that these are, office, quote, these are officers who are of great merit and knowledge and who have no affection for Napoleon. So again, French officers. I have asked them about what strategy would be best in the coming war. Uh, taking into account the theater of operations, the strength, and the character of our adversary. And these French officers assured me, Chernyshev says, that Napoleon would again seek decisive battle at the start of the campaign, and therefore you, the Russians, should avoid giving him what he wants. So, again, even on the French side, the more uh, critically minded and anti-Napoleon officers also urged the uh, Russians to be uh, defensive minded. The lesser known memorandum, and the one that uh, I think is very interesting, and the listeners can find the full text of it online uh, since I translated and published it. So you can just Google uh, the author's name uh, and memorandum. And you can see that uh, this individual, Peter Chutkevich, who was a senior official in the Chancellery of the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of War in uh, Russia. So he was a close uh, advisor of uh, General uh, Mikhail Barclay de Tolly. Uh, he prepared a very interesting memorandum, uh, once again reiterating uh, both the avoidance of decisive battles, uh, exploiting every opportunity to deny Napoleon the very means to conduct operation, to conduct effectively a guerrilla war. Uh, now, it doesn't mean exciting uh, a popular uprising, but rather conducting this guerrilla war through irregular uh, or asymmetrical, which is more modern kind of term to say, uh, means, right, you know, organizing flying detachments and so on, and, and exhausting him until, uh, exhausting the enemy until the right moment. Um, ultimately, the Tsar um, lent a willing ear to the Prussian, however, general. This is a general who came to Russia in the wake of the, Prus uh, the catastrophic defeat Prussia experienced in 1806. He became close advisor to the Tsar, uh, General uh, Karl Ludwig August von Fuhl, uh, who um, seems to have come out on top. Now, the reason why this slide is entitled, you know, official plan question mark is because we've never really located at the plan. We never found a, a, the copy, let's say, signed off on uh, by Alexander which said this is what we're going to do so he gave backing to fool's writings but there is no one plan like one document that would have uh, laid it all out full strategy as far as we can uh, see 
uh, required the first army to fall back to the fortified camp at Drissa, which if you look at the contemporary writings, this Drissa uh, uh, camp was broadly modeled after the fortified lines of Torres Vedras, which Bill Wellington built in Portugal. And the idea was that we'll, that the first army will retreat to the Drissa camp, and you see that uh, on the map, hold the positions there, uh, uh, keep the French at bay, while the second Western army uh, would um, strike the enemy into the flank and against the lines of communication. Now, sound as this plan may look on paper, it ignored uh, uh, fundamental facts on the ground, and the biggest of them was that uh, Russians were outnumbered by at least two to one, and especially in case of Bagration, by uh, more than three to one, and Second Western Army was simply not strong enough to attempt any diversion. Uh, and so Barclay de Tolly and a small group of officers who surround him understood that neither of the Russian armies could really stand and fight at this uh, uh, crucial first few weeks of the war. So for them, retreat was the only sensible strategy, but this policy of retreat was never formally adopted uh, as, as, a, as, as official uh, strategy, uh, or neither was it clearly, and I want to emphasize it's clearly communicated to the army and corps commanders, uh, so, which meant that in the first few weeks of the war, uh, these commanders were uh, exasperated by conflicting orders and the insistence on continued retreat. Bagration, if you read Bagration's letters, uh, he is furious at being told to keep falling back. Uh, because he doesn't even know how large the enemy army is. He's actually uh, acting under the misconception that um, Napoleon only has about a quarter million troops, when in reality he had doubled that size, right? Uh, even um, senior officials in Barclay de Tolis, um, Ministry of, uh, of, of War, uh, like Arseny Zakrevsky, who was the head of Special Chancellery, read military intelligence, even, even he expressed the frustration that was felt by many, and he wrote, for example, in early July, so this is at the start of the war, he wrote to a friend, we have, mendered, we have meandered around speedily and then retreated even faster to that unfortunate position at Drissa, which it seems would lead us straight to destruction, uh, and he thought that fool and uh, others should be shot for suggesting it. Now, I'm not going to talk about the campaign as such, because, again, m most of your listeners are familiar with the broad strokes of the campaign. You know that Russian armies retreated um, through uh, uh, Ukrainian countryside um, uh, all the way to Smolensk, and you can see uh, Smolensk being uh, right here, right, right here. So this is all the way to Smolensk. Um, and, of course, this retreat um, uh, occasioned considerable, um, you know, kind of, debate and discussion among, uh, among the Russian officers. Uh, as I said, many of them uh, acting on the, uh, in, the, in the information vacuum, not provided sufficient understanding of what is happening. Um, and a and, uh, crucial figure in this uh, is, is Bagration, the, the commander-in-chief of the second Western Army, the second largest army in Russia, uh, who feels being slighted by uh, being told to follow the orders of Barclay de Tolly, who, in terms of ranking, was junior in rank, but as a minister of war had, uh, could pull the rank on him. Um, and uh, Bagration became uh, a, a kind of a, a central figure in what Russian historians increasingly refer to as the mutiny of generals, where the Russian senior officers began talking about forcibly removing Barclay de Tolly, um, who was uh, accused of being a foreigner, um, he was of Scottish origin, although his uh, ancestors settled in what is today Baltic states uh, in Kurland and Livonia uh, in, 17, uh, in late 17th century, uh, and Barclay de Tolly uh, served in the Russian army uh, for quite some time, but nonetheless he was accused of being a foreigner. Uh, and of course, Barclay de Tolly was surrounded by a significant number of uh, uh, officers who were not of Russian descent. M many of them uh, uh, of Germanic uh, descent, but uh, Germans living inside the Russian Empire, but also a significant number of them, uh, Germans, especially Prussians, who came to Russia in the wake of Napoleon's victories in 1805-1806. And so the perception was that 
these foreigners are effectively selling us out and they are uh, uh, weakening. Um, let's see here. And of course, the, the Battle of Smolensk is in many respects the, uh, the, decisive, the decisive moment in this sense uh, because um, uh, Smolensk is the first major uh, Russian, so, you know, this from the this traditional Russian point of view, Russian city that is uh, surrendered. Uh, the previous territories that the Russians uh, retreated through, these are the territories the Russian Empire acquired through the partitions of Poland uh, relatively recently. Uh, as you remember, the last partition of Poland took place in 1795, right? It was uh, finalized. And so it was perceived to be like a Polish Lithuanian lands that were that uh, uh, Russian officers were okay with giving up temporarily at least. But now with Smolensk, we talk about kind of Russian heartlands being surrendered. And so that occasioned this vociferous response. And even before the battle was over, Tsar uh, um, uh, is, is forced by the popular opinion to make a choice that something has to change in the leadership position. And that's where uh, this man gets the job. Right? Um, General Mikhail Galenishev Kutuzov uh, was one of the uh, most experienced men, uh, military commanders in Russia at this time. He is actually the most senior active figure uh, in the Russian army. And he was, uh, you know, he, his life is very interesting. And I've long been kind of critical and dismissive of him until I, I started researching his life in, in, in great detail. And I developed a great uh, degree of respect for him. Um, I think I can separate his character, which I still have issues with, from his talent. And he was a talented military figure. Uh, uh, so I think my, my, in my book, I try to give him um, that credit that he was a very versatile commander. And I remind the listeners that um, he came, uh, he became the command, supreme commander of the Russian forces in August of 1812 uh, in the wake of a very interesting and triumphant campaign he waged against the Ottoman Turks and the Nubian principalities. So that, that really extolled his reputation uh, and gave the Tsar kind of the grounds to appoint him. But there are other kind of no less important factors going for him. Um, remember that he's, uh, he belongs to this uh, an ancient Russian noble uh, family. He is a landowner, which is an important uh, factor considering that Barclay d'Otelie um, was quite poor. In fact, uh, one of the contemporaries writes that if Barclay de Tolly is fired tomorrow, he will die on a pile of excrement uh, uh, because he has nothing uh, to his, uh, on his life to, to, to survive by. Um, and Kutuzov was well connected, um, both uh, at the court and in and, and ability. So there were several factors going for him. And so in August, um, he is selected um, by a special extraordinary committee uh, presented to uh, Alexander. Alexander doesn't like him much, and there is a long history of that, which we can discuss in Q&A. But he famously uh, says that he has to go along with the popular opinion. And so he signs off on uh, his candidacy on August 19. And then 12 days later, Kutuzov uh, joins the army the main, uh, you know, the, the first and Western combined armies at Tsarevo Zaymyshe. Kutuzov knew what he was up against. Um, rem remember, Kutuzov commanded the Russian army against Napoleon in 1805, and he studied Napoleon. In fact, that's one of the kind of uh, things that we forget about this man that was a good student of history, military history, and he followed Napoleon's campaigns quite closely. Uh, so he knew what he was up against. Uh, the war against Napoleon would be, his, he told a, 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 a friend, a mammoth and extremely difficult endeavor. Now he had witnessed the uh, Napoleon's military brilliance at Austerlitz and he followed uh, Napoleon's uh, uh, victories at Jena, at um, Eilau, at Finland, uh, gaining a great deal of respect for the men that he considered in his letters uh, uh, as the, quote, first captain of the age. A family member, for example, remembers, uh, remembered Kutuzov admitting that he was, quote, an enthusiastic admirer of Napoleon's military genius and that he admitted 
uh, occasionally even of dreaming <laughs> of dreaming uh, of Napoleon in his in his dreams. Uh, whenever somebody criticized Napoleon, Kutuzov actually, and again, this is an interesting character trait that he has. Uh, Kutuzov often came to his defense, and uh, one of his um, uh, aide camps, or who later on became a, a, a very uh, important historian, Alexander Mikhailovsky Danilevsky, uh, he noted in his journal that, uh, and this is a, a quote, carried away by my youthful bashfulness, I once allowed myself to utter a few derogatory remarks about Napoleon, Mikhailovsky Danilevsky uh, 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 comments. Kutuzov curtly interrupted me and he told me, young man, what right do you have to mock one of the greatest commanders in history? Stop these unseemly insults and, at once. And this is happening in 1812, right in the midst of this war. So Kutuzov does have a great deal of respect for Napoleon. As Kutuzov was leaving for the army uh, in late August in 1812, he confided to his family that he felt, quote, overpowered by the magnitude of the responsibility that he was taking upon himself. He knew that despite losses sustained in the two months of the campaigning, uh, Napoleon's Grand Armée remained a powerful force whose strength uh, Russian intelligence estimated at over 165,000 men, slightly exaggerated. Uh, Napoleon probably had about 145,000 uh, 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 in August of 1812. Now, by contrast, the combined strength of first and second Western armies, that is, Russian armies, was roughly 100,000 men. Uh, and among the Russian troops, this continual retreat, uh, agitation over suspected treason, supply problems, and the emotional strains of the war had produced what Barclay de Tolly himself acknowledged were, quote, disorders, abuses, and thieving that increased with each passing day and nudged the army closer to ruin." Unquote. So Kutuzov uh, understood when he came to army that he needed to, first of all, to restore order, uh, raise spirits, kind of rally the army around, and so he, he uh, did just that. Um, but he immediately, he understood, so here's, when, when Tsar was choosing him, right, he, Tsar chose him with an understanding that uh, this policy of retreat had to end and that Russians had to contest the ground. And Kutuzov kind of gives him this evasive answer that, uh, yes, uh, you know, I will try, but depends on circumstances. Um, and by the time he reaches uh, army, he receives kind of a crucial piece of intelligence, and that is that Smolensk has fallen. And Kutuzov immediately understands the importance of it. He famously says, uh, uh, Smolensk is the key to Moscow. And, and he was right, because Smolensk is a strategically important uh, city. Uh, 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 and the fall of it opened the pathway uh, for, for Napoleon to invade deeper into Russia. Uh, and uh, second piece of intelligence then that uh, Kutuzov receives was when he already was at the army, and that is he was uh, able to look at actual uh, uh, reports on the condition of the army, and he uh, was uh, shocked to see how uh, disorganized and really weakened the army was. And attacking with this weakened army was both unrealistic and, most crucially, it went against Kutuzov's very being as a commander. In all of his prior campaigns, he had relied on careful assessment of the situation and the preference for maneuver until all advantages were firmly on his side. And so there was no reason to expect him to behave any differently in August, and certainly not when facing a brilliant opponent like Napoleon. Uh, uh, and, and so he grasped that only further withdrawal would give him precious time to mobilize the manpower, to mobilize resources, to rally around the army, and kind of wait for an opportune moment to strike back. And so that's where Kutuzov starts talking, uh, uh, kind of expressing his inner thoughts, where uh, for him to prevail over Napoleon, what was needed, not a decisive battle as such, by the careful strategy and, most crucially, a war of attrition. And that is why, if we look at his correspondence or the memoirs or letters of others who have written around this time, we, we find that whenever he talked publicly about you know, what his plans were, he always spoke not of defeating this word, kind of defeating Napoleon, but rather, interestingly, he used the term outsmarting, you know, in, in Russian, outsmarting him. 
And what he meant by this is that instead of giving Napoleon that tactical or operational advantage of, of bringing Russians to battle, he will wage a more of a grand strategic battle of attrition and exhausting him. And so as he left the capital, Kutuzov replied to all the salutations uh, saying, I beseech the Lord to let me outsmart Napoleon. And after joining the army, he admitted in a candid conversation that, uh, quote, Napoleon might defeat me in a, in a battle, but he would never be able to defeat me in a war, which is a very interesting statement, right? Because here we, we see is Kutuzov kind of priding himself on his ability to think long term. He was convinced of the geographic advantages Russia possessed. Napoleon may have conquered most of Europe, but those countries had neither the climate nor resources that Russia possessed. Uh, and, uh, of course, Kutuzov is not the only one who believes that. Tsar himself told the French ambassador uh, on the eve of the war that, quote, we shall not place ourselves in jeopardy. We have space and we shall preserve a well-organized army. Kutuzov wholeheartedly agreed with this notion. Uh, in fact, conversing with a French prisoner, he, and, and this comes from this prisoner's uh, uh, later, uh, later testimony, uh, Kutuzov explained that as soon as the war commenced, he was determined to give away as much land as possible to, in this are Kutuzov's words, to exhaust Napoleon's army, to spread it thin, and to weaken it through fatigue and, fam and famine. So, there is no doubt in my mind that uh, a retreat, just like Barclay de Tolly thought about retreating, right, uh, uh, Kutuzov also shared it. Uh, in that sense, Kutuzov is, uh, in August, in late August of 1812, is ripping the harvest that Barclay de Tolly had pay, painstakingly sown over the preceding two months. Uh, but it is also, again, important for me to stress that Kutuzov was convinced in the appropriateness of strategy of retreat, of the strategy of attrition, uh, uh, at a time when uh, many of senior Russian officers, generals, uh, continue to insist on counterattacking the French. So Kutuzov's real advantage was that unlike Barclay de Tolly, he was of more prominent social standing, read noble status, right, was well connected, uh, both in, in his social milieu in the right, uh, large, you know, wider nobility, but also at the court, and possessed the perception, uh, trust, confidence of the army and society. Uh, and that is a crucial uh, element because Barclay de Tolly lacked all, all three of that. He understood, that is, Kutuzov understood that uh, he, to defeat Napoleon, he, he needed to beat his time. This would not be popular strategy, he, he knew that. After all, Barclay de Tolly had been castigated for insisting on that same approach. Uh, but um, Kutuzov had something... Uh, 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 extra as, as a, as a uh, kind of uh, uh, that, that Barclay de Tolly didn't have, and that is uh, Tsar appointed him as the supreme commander of the Russian forces. So he could also had an ability to tap much larger pool and expect obedience uh, from the other officers uh, when Barclay de Tolly couldn't do that. And I think uh, looking broadly, right, this is where I see Kutuzov's strength. Right, that uh, you know his greater credibility, his charisma, his skill to manipulate circumstances to his advantage. Um, he may not have been the most brilliant general of his, of this era, but I think his background, character, and experiences precisely match the circumstances. Uh, he respected Napoleon, but was not overawed by him. Uh, nor did he feel threatened by the groups of Russian officers who openly. Uh, castigated and, and, and almost mutinied by, against Barclay de Tolly. And so, therefore, Kutuzov was in a position to implement a military policy for which his predecessor had been so viciously up, uh, upbraided. Um, and, and so, uh, there is, however, one crucial element in this story, and that is Kutuzov knew that he couldn't simply continue retreating, uh, that he had to give the public, he needed to give the army kind of red meat, right? This, you know, something to rally around. And that rally, you know, that cause was the battle. And that's uh, when I look closely at, at uh, Kutuzov's thinking, I see that the battle of, at Borodino, the 
the battle at uh, Moskova, as, as the French are refer uh, referring to, was not necessarily intended uh, by Kutuzov to defeat Napoleon, right? If, if uh, because um, you know, in his letters, uh, you, you can see that his expectation is is more to contain uh, a Napoleonic invasion. Uh, in fact, he has this wonderful expression in one of the letters, in, in several actually letters, not just one, when he says that his intent is to let the French break their teeth on us at Borodino. And if we look at, um, I think I thought I had a map here, but if we look at the map uh, of the battle, uh, then you see that uh, how entrenched Russian positions were at Borodino, right? You, you see that there were 10 uh, uh, um, almost dozen redoubts and fortifications built on the right flank. There was a massive uh, great redoubt, or Ayevsky's redoubt, built in the center. And of course, on the left flank, Bagration's flashes also anchored it. So this was a, 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 and the entire army was standing behind Semyonovsky stream, uh, which was again designed to, uh, to take advantage of the natural environment to, uh, uh, to delay the French attacks, to, to weaken the the impetus behind them. Uh, and Kutuzov felt confident that the Russian army behind these natural barriers and the, this um, artificially constructed battlements would be able to withstand French frontal attacks and which he knew would inherently cost more to the attacking side. Now, uh, even if Napoleon gained the victory, Kutuzov expected that it would be a Pyrrhic one considering the conditions. And if Napoleon found the Russian position too strong and decided to maneuver around it, then Kutuzov actually was ready to abandon this position and fall back uh, towards Moscow, which ultimately that's what he does. And so we have this battle uh, at Borodino, which, as we, we, as we all know, is, is, is a, um, in many respects a, a, a stalemate, right? Uh, the, you know, both sides suffer significant losses, uh, well over 40,000 casualties on the Russian side, probably 35, 36,000 casualties on the French side. Uh, and uh, I think the only grounds for Napoleon claiming the victory is the fact that Kutuzov indeed orders retreat from Borodino. Uh, uh, because in many respects, he gained what he wanted, and that is uh, the reality that Russian army confronted Napoleon. There was a decisive battle and it survived. And then comes the second very important decision that he makes. And already I see that decision made uh, in, in the context of Borodino when Kutuzov knows that from Borodino to Moscow, there's only one step and there is no way he can hold position anywhere there. And there, there's no way he can uh, confront Napoleon again. And so he no. makes the decision already even before reaching Moscow to, to I think, uh, surrender it. But he can't publicly reveal it, and I think he goes uh, through the charade of holding a council at Philly, where he uh, expects senior officers, just generals, to express their opinions before finally making a decision to give up Moscow and let uh, Moscow, uh, sorry, uh, Napoleon, uh, to take it. Now that decision, uh, to me, is is very, uh, very important. Now. Kutuzov was not the only general who believed in that abandoning Moscow was right. For example, Barclay also uh, voiced for it. But in my mind, um, Kutuzov is the only one who could make this decision and then remain at the helm of the army. No other general at this time would have survived uh, making such a momentous decision. Had Barclay de Tolly given such an order, he would have likely been strung up at, at, at the nearest tree. Uh, and there is a wonderful uh, contemporary uh, evidence for it. Uh, one of the artillery officers, and I'm in the midst of translating uh, uh, his four volumes of memoirs, one of the best Napoleonic memoirs, if you ask me. Well, this author, Ilya Radzitsky, uh, um, comments, you know, he's there, he's, he's witnessing all of this, and he comments that only Kutuzov, quote, the true son of Russia who was suckled with her breast milk could have given Moscow without a fight and survive. Such a great sacrifice only seemed acceptable it was, if it was offered by the one chosen defender of the fatherland. Um, and Kutuzov, of course, you know, knew they understood the, the, mom, how momentous this, is, this decision is. He was quite rattled and angry and frustrated by all contemporary evidence. 
Um, uh, and uh, we know that when he was passing through Moscow, and by the way, Moscow was uh, already, uh, uh, you know, the fires were already breaking out uh, uh, as, as the Russian army was passing through. So uh, if, you know, I wrote a separate volume on, on this event, and I'm not subscribing to the deliberate right, planning of destruction of Moscow, but uh, the Russians certainly had a, a hand in it, and including Kutuzov himself, because on the way out, he ordered the destruction of the military magazines. So you can imagine what would happen in a city that is being evacuated if you set uh, the military depots on fire. Uh, but uh, amidst this, uh, uh, this gloomy kind of, uh, you know, the fiery uh, uh, situation, um, Kutuzov is uh, retreating through the Moscow, and one of the officers rode up to him and told him about the French troops entering Moscow, and he famously spies. Uh, with God's help, this will be their last triumph. Here we come then to this crucial, uh, you know, again, assessment. Why did uh, Kutuzov kind of choose to surrender uh, Moscow? And here, um, his decision is, in many respects, political, and, 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 and more of a strategic political, because um, Kutuzov looked at Napoleon and, and this invasion, as he, he uses this expression, the torrent. This is the, you know, like uh, one of those mountainous torrents that suddenly comes, springs on you, and smashes everything on its way and rushes through the valley. That it is hard to contain this torrent unless you have some kind of big sponge, right? Uh, and Napoleon uh, Kutuzov looks at Moscow just uh, exactly as the sponge. And here I see his grand strategy. He, he knows that Napoleon is a political animal and that as both military commander and the statesman, Napoleon will seek political solution to this war. In the lack of this decisive victory, he will need the political solution. And what Kutuzov bats on, and we see that in his writing, is that when, he enters, when Napoleon enters Moscow, Kutuzov bats that he will stop there and he will try to politically negotiate this war. And that's when Kutuzov uses that expression that Moscow will be the sponge that will soak up the torrent that once Napoleon goes in he will not get out until he will find some kind of political solution and that gives uh, Kutuzov exactly what he needs and that is time time to rebuild time to mobilize which brings me to the third crucial element in his uh, kind of strategy and that is um, when he was retreating from Moscow Kutuzov had uh, several options uh, to, to kind of uh, retreat. One, he could have gone to uh, Yaroslavl, he could have gone to Vladimir. Uh, in fact, on the eve of uh, surrendering Moscow, while he was at Philly right here, other generals were offering him to switch and go south. But Kutuzov uh, demurred on all of this because uh, he was smartly uh, kind of arguing that if they if they turn from Moscow before surrendering Moscow, right, if they just turn here and then kind of, you know, went back, you know, went south, Napoleon will simply follow the army because the focus will be still on, the, or Napoleon's focus will be still on destroying the main enemy force. But if Napoleon goes into Moscow, right, that's when Kutuzov thinks he will shift his focus on maintaining the symbol of Russian right historical might, this former capital, the place where the czars are cr uh, uh, crowned, right the, uh, the 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 historical center of, of Moscovite Rus, and instead what Kutuzov will do is he will shift the um, axis of operations. Instead of marching further to the east or marching further northeast, he will pretend that he is marching southeast, but then conduct a flanking maneuver to threaten French uh, lines of operation. And I think this is a brilliant um, approach, uh, brilliant um, kind of um, decision on his part, uh, because it underscores his flexibility as a commander. Uh, it, it's not that he's seeking to provoke Napoleon uh, to, to a battle, not at all. He's nimble enough to uh, march further south until the confluence of Moscow and, and uh, Moscow River and uh, Pakhara River right here, 
and then leaves a, a kind of a cover, a, a cover of several Cossack regiments and then switches his direction of uh, attack. But notice he doesn't go all the way here because what he doesn't want to do is to let Napoleon leave Moscow and not come out. Instead, he goes for the south and positions himself at the, uh, at the uh, village of Torutino, which offers him several advantages. One, uh, that he is close enough to the uh, lines of cooperation of, uh, of Napoleon, so he can threaten it. Uh, he is also close enough to Moscow, where he can uh, um, conduct uh, um, in, you know, uh, intelligence gathering, or more crucially, is, uh, uh, to initiate what he called the Little War, Malaya Vaina. And what it meant for Kutuzov was to organize dozens of flying detachments, organize, you know, kind of, uh, that will be engaged in a guerrilla uh, a war uh, targeting the isolated French units, targeting the lines of communications, lines of supplies, and more than a dozen of these regiment of these flying detachments, made up of regular troops, uh, mostly Cossacks with some regular cavalry, uh, will be operating around uh, around uh, Moscow, trying to isolate uh, increasingly Napoleon here. Um, and a third element in, in, in the process is Kutuzov will also try to provoke a pop popular uprising, popular response uh, to the enemy presence. And I'll talk about them uh, in, 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 a bit, in, in more details in a, in a second. This Tarutino maneuver, as, as uh, Kutuzov's uh, operation became known, uh, gave Kutuzov all of that. And Napoleon actually uh, soon enough realized that. Uh, in later on, um, just about a year and a half after this event, uh, while talking to uh, a captured Russian general, Napoleon remarked that Kutuzov did what he ought to have done. His measures were judicious. So, um, and I think coming from a, a brilliant man like Napoleon in terms of military, uh, I think that's a statement in itself. Uh, and, and he also, uh, in another conversation, admitted, and this is a quote, your willy Kutuzov pulled a good one on me with that flanking march, Napoleon, again, uh, 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 um, uh, notes. So, um, at Tarutino, right here, uh, Kutuzov established um, a fortified camp. And you can notice here, um, let me use maybe different color, uh, all this black, right, these are fortifications, and you can see the degree of protection that he affords to the army. Um, and behind, <clears throat> behind this fortified camp, uh, the army could rest, uh, could rebuild itself. And Kutuzov will spend uh, next three, three weeks here, uh, Kutuzov taking advantage of this respite to begin reorganizing the army. Uh, uh, because in the preceding month of campaigning, especially in the Battle of Smolensk and Borodino, Russian regiments had been grievously weakened, some effectively were wrecked. And so Kutuzov's immediate task was to rebuild these units and to instill discipline among the troops who did, and I, uh, uh, in, in the book I discuss the degree to which they uh, uh, behaved so uh, rather appallingly uh, in and around Moscow. And so over the next three weeks, they raised, uh, for example, over two dozen cavalry regiments. They brought uh, reinforcements to replenish infantry regiments. They established supply system. Um, and of course, this, these three weeks were crucial uh, uh, in reviving the Russian military capacity. Uh, for example, by late October, uh, the Russian strength increased from uh, 60 uh, 5,000 uh, men to, or, or to well over 120,000 with an artillery train of more than 620 cannons. Uh, the number of infantry leapt from 35,000, battle-ready for infantry, from 35,000 in late September to over 60,000 in mid-October. And as I mentioned, um, over uh, two dozen Cossack regiments, each 500 men strong, would be raised, equipped, and delivered here. Uh, which will allow Kutuzov to conduct these uh, you know, irregular operations more effectively. So all these are of crucial, uh, are of crucial benefit to the Russian uh, uh, strategy. Um, and uh, when we get to this point of um, 
um, uh, of the small war, right? Kutuzov uh, knew that the time is one of the most precious commodity in, in, in war. Uh, and uh, he writes, for example, with autumn fast approaching, uh, the Napoleon's ability uh, to march with the main army would be, quote, progressively more difficult. And so what he decides, again, through October, is he uh, is determined to avoid any major confrontations with Napoleon, to keep Napoleon in Moscow, and instead, instead to wage that small war, Malaya Vaina. The main objective of this asymmetrical warfare was to hinder and prevent movement of enemy reserves, interrupt supply deliveries, attack isolated enemy forces, conduct diversionary attacks, and in general, reduce the effectiveness of enemy operation through attrition. Uh, flying detachments uh, were of, uh, organized, more than a dozen of them, commanded by Vasily Arlov Denisov, Alexander Figner, Alexander Seslavin, Stackelberg, Kudashev, Balabin, and many, many others who were uh, told to fan out across the countryside and effectively encircle Moscow. And their goal was not just to observe the enemy, but as I said, to wage this war of attrition. In fact, if we read the instructions that Kutuzov gives to these commanders, they are particularly interesting uh, for what they reveal about his conception of this uh, asymmetrical warfare. Uh, the goal of this war, Kutuzov write, was to, quote, to inflict the greatest possible losses upon the enemy. When he learned that one of these flying detachments, uh, commander, one of these flying detachments, had allowed himself to be surprised by the French and uh, surrounded and barely managed to break out. Well, Kutuzov wrote a letter chewing him out, and he explained to this commander that, quote, a guerrilla fighter should never find himself in such a position as so as to be surprised. And he continues to explain to, the, to this man, the flying detachments must be constantly on the move and should, should remain in one spot only for as long as it takes to feed men and horses. Marching has to be done at night, covertly, along remote tracks. During the, man, during the day, your men should remain hidden in the woods or lying, laying places, and then your goal is to act, quote, decisively, swiftly, and tirelessly in, uh, uh, in uh, causing, uh, uh, in, in inflicting damage on the enemy forces. Um, in addition to this, in addition to this small war, which by mid-October Kutuzov was happy to report that uh, I'm waging small war with great advantages. Well, in addition to it, uh, Kutuzov also deliberately incited popular uprising because he, was, he understood the power uh, that this uh, popular anger, kind of popular hatred against the invader could offer him. Uh, he urged his subordinates, for example, to give captured weapons to the peasants and to inspire them by, uh, to inspire the peasants by, quote, reciting to them examples of heroism displayed in other places. In a letter to the Tsar, Kutuzov explained that unlike many Russian aristocrats who feared that arming the serfs was, would be dangerous, that he, Kutuzov, was actually in favor of it. Um, he just wanted, he, he just said, the leadership needs to be provided by the nobility uh, and then kind of direct this anger, the peasant anger, in a, in a constructive manner. And indeed, dozens of peasant groups, some ad hoc, some assisted by regular troops, were soon uh, uh, operating across the countryside and indeed wrecking havoc on Napoleon's supply. I, I think I have a slide here. Let me see. No, not yet. Um, uh, and, and wrecking havoc on Napoleon's supply and communication lines. Um, controlling, of course, and coordinating such a massive uh, uh, of movement was an impossible task. And inciting this popular war was indeed fraught with danger. What if you can't control the serfs? But Kutuzov understood it and, and still remained convinced that benefits of mobilizing the serfs outweigh fears of popular revolts. In fact, whenever landowners were threatened by the unruly peasants, right? whenever these peasants turned on the landowners, Kutuzov actually had no qualms about using the full might of regular army to crush those uh, bands of peasants. Uh, and, and ruthlessly punish the perpetrators. And so here you have this kind of carrot and stick approach uh, where he was both inciting and harnessing popular fury against the enemy 
but not too much so as not to undermine the social order. And um, I love uh, Tolstoy, right? Leo Tolstoy uh, in The War and Peace has a wonderful passage when he says, Napoleon uh, took up this, you know, when, upon reaching Moscow, Tolstoy writes, Napoleon took up this suitable fencing pose only to discover that instead of re a rapier, his opponent was wielding a peasant's cudgel. And French repeatedly complained about the atrocities that the Russian peasantry were committing against the French troops. And Kutuzov consistently paid no heed to them, uh, to these protestations, uh, prote pro uh, protestations uh, instead determined to maximize the benefit. Um, in October, you have this famous encounter between Kutuzov and Napoleon's uh, uh, envoy, uh, General Loriston, a, a distinguished diplomat, uh, Napoleon um, has previously reached out twice to the Russians in, in effort to negotiate peace. He has been in Moscow for 35 days, and this is one of the crucial mistakes he makes. And again, I, uh, I want to emphasize that Kutuzov anticipated that as a political being, Napoleon would find it irresistible to give up on Moscow and retreat prematurely. And that, you know, that will give Kutuzov the space, the time to rebuild the army. And indeed, he was right. Even after Napoleon's uh, uh, efforts to solicit peace uh, and, and uh, kind of initiate negotiations with the Tsar were rebuffed repeatedly, he still, Napoleon still insists on staying in Moscow. And so here in, in uh, October, uh, he sent Loriston uh, for the meeting. And Napoleon met with Loriston, and he listened to the uh, peace overture that Napoleon uh, uh, gave. And what is interesting about this meeting is this. When Tsar appointed Kutuzov in August as the supreme commander, he specifically, specifically told him that under no circumstances he was supposed to meet with the representatives of the French emperor and undertake any negotiations. And yet... In October, as soon as he is told that the Loriston is on the out, at the outpost asking for meeting, Kutuzov agrees. Uh, so, in fact, in violation of Tsar's kind of instructions. And then after the meeting, when he listens to it, and uh, what happens during the meeting is uh, Kutuzov, uh, 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 you know, Loriston tells Kutuzov that, hey, we've tried reaching out to Tsar. We don't know if the letters are reaching him or not. Can you deliver this offer? And Kutuzov, knowing full well that neither the Tsar nor really anyone uh, cares for these political negotiations with Napoleon, actually says, sure, I will uh, deliver it. In fact, the following morning, after Lorison departs, Kutuzov wrote a lengthy account of this meeting and dispatched two messengers to St. Petersburg. The first messenger, carrying Kutuzov's condemnation of the Cossack behavior, and the endorsement of diplomatic discussions was instructed to travel close uh, to travel close to the French patrols and inadvertently fall into their hands as to make Napoleon believe that the Russians were considering the offer. And then at the same time, the second messenger uh, took a more circuitous route to the capital carrying a copy of Napoleon's message and Kutuzov's report in which he rejected French demands and urged the emperor to fight on. And so here what I see is Kutuzov clearly baiting Napoleon, right? Now, the Tsar didn't, um, didn't, didn't find Kutuzov's actions humorous, actually. He was rather displeased with Kutuzov. And he writes this uh, stringent letter back saying, and this is a quote, In the interview I had with you when I confided my armies to your command, I informed you specifically of my firm desire to avoid all negotiations with the enemy and all relations with him. And so now, after what has transpired with Loriston, Tsar says, I must repeat with the same resolution that I desire this principle to be observed by you to the fullest extent and in the most rigorous and inflexible manner. I mean, how more clear can the Tsar be, right? And then, yet, this is really fascinating and it gives you a sense of Kutuzov Right, doing his own thing, even after you know, Tsar telling him not to. Well, later on, in late October, uh, uh, Napoleon sends another representative. And guess what Kutuzov does? 
he actually meets him, <laughs> meets with him and continues to talk to him, giving the impression that he's willing to uh, to um, entertain the uh, uh, kind of to to entertain uh, the possibility of of talking with um, uh, with Napoleon. Later on, um, about in November, uh, the Fr uh, the Russians will capture a, a French commissary official, uh, Louis Guillaume uh, Pubusque. And Kutuzov will have a conversation with him, and Pubusk will write it down almost almost at, this, uh, at that time. And he re he writes in this uh, uh, recollection that Kutuzov admitted that his decision to meet Lauriston and the other subsequent Napoleon's envoy uh, that this decision was driven by his desire to outsmart Napoleon by prolonging the impression that Russians might be. Uh, willing to negotiate. And he has this wonderful passage in it that I have on the screen. In politics, you don't miss an opportunity that spontaneously presents itself to you. And here I think listeners will kind of I think, be reminded of Clausewitz's famous postulation that war is a continuation of politics by other means. Kutuzov would have, would have completely agreed with that, right? You see here, he talks about in politics, and here he he's at war, right? You don't miss an opportunity. Um, and so, indeed, uh, he tells Pubus that he ex he wanted to talk to the envoys, and he wanted to send letters to St. Petersburg because, and he, this is a quote, the distance between St. Petersburg and Moscow required time. And time was precisely what Kutuzov needed to continue marshalling resources for the war, molding his raw recruits into fighting regiments, and most crucially, draining the Grand Armée. He confessed to having, and this is an interesting comment he makes, he confessed to having studied for some time Napoleon's character. And he was convinced as, for, as, as soon as the war had began that Napoleon could only be defeated through long-term war that would, and this is a quote from Kutuzov again, that would spread and exhaust his army and cause fatigue, exhaustion, and famine before, as another quote, harshness of the climate would destroy it. So Kutuzov, then Pibusk says, was astonished, and this is a quote, at how easy, <laughs> how easy it was for his trick uh, uh, to, to outsmart Napoleon and for all the tricks that he had employed to be successful in keeping the French in Moscow. And then he scoffs at the end of the conversation at, quote, Napoleon's ridiculous expectation of peace when he no longer had the necessary forces to wage war. It was precisely because Napoleon clung to, so conspicuously to the idea of peace that it was possible to ignore the fact that there remained for him no other hope of salvation, Kutuzov observed. And so the commander's conviction of growing of weakness only is strengthened by late October when Napoleon makes a decision to retreat. And I think this approach, this approach of long, um, you know, grand strategic approach of long war of attrition, of baiting Napoleon, of exploiting the opportunities uh, to leave even the impression that the Russians are willing to consider uh, negotiating is one of the fundamental reasons why Kutuzov was able to both uh, keep the Russian army intact, rebuild it, and wait for an opportune moment to strike back. Now, I know my, I'm, I'm uh, overstaying your welcome, so how about I wrap up here, and then we can uh, discuss the rest in the Q&A session, Tom. Sure. A uh, bit, bit, bit of a cliffhanger. Why don't you give us a... The, a quick summation of, of what happens after the, this moment. Uh, what, what prompts Napoleon to withdraw from Moscow and, and what happens from there? So I like Kutuzov, I baited you, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, October is an interesting moment in that sense because um, this approach that Kutuzov is, is cultivating, this is a long, drawn out war um, earned him actually comparisons to Quintus Fabius. Uh, your listeners probably remember the Roman general who fought H Hannibal during the Punic War. 
Uh, in fact, some of contemporaries referred to Kutuzov, uh, you know, whose name was Mikhail Ilarionovich Golanishev Kutuzov, well, they referred to him as Fabius Ilarionovich. Um, but this this war, and you know, the, you know, this is the strategy of make, uh, to make use of time, space, and climate. Of course, was not popular. And by late October, there is a significant uh, kind of um, anger in the Russian army, especially in the Tarutino, where they've been sitting for three weeks. Um, no, you know, the, the army itself is not engaged in, in the fighting, and they're eager to fight. Uh, the troops are, co are complaining about lack of action. The generals are uh, very impatient. A and by, um, a group of them, um, led by General Benningson, uh, actually force him, uh, almost literally force him, to uh, accept battle um, uh, at, at a place called Vinkovo or, or Tarutino. Now, Kutuzov doesn't want this battle because he thinks it's premature. It's not that he doesn't want to fight Napoleon. It's that he thinks it's premature that Grand Armée still has the battle capacity to cause hardship, right, and, and, and inflict uh, possibly defeat. Uh, and uh, he, he, he wants to avoid it for a bit more. Uh, but Benningsen and others force him to fight this battle. Kutuzov actually does an interesting thing. He allows Benningsen to take the lead in, the, in, in this battle. Kutuzov stays behind, and you can see it here on this map. He's actually in the back, while Benningsen actually takes the charge of the uh, battle array. And the battle is not, uh, um, is not as successful as the Russians hoped for. Uh, here you see this kind of um, uh, uh, long-term problems, that is, petty squabbles between the units, poor staff work, bad luck. Uh, for example, distances between various columns uh, were proper, in, improperly correlated, and the movements were co not coordinated. So when some units began attacking on the right flank, uh, others were not even in position. There was also the bad luck involved, for example, when one of the corps began attacking, uh, the commander uh, of that corps, uh, right here on the second corps, um, the commander of it, uh, General uh, Karl Bagavut, was shot dead, causing confusion. So all this to say that what should have been a, a, a great success actually turned out to be an incomplete victory. And the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this is because while this battle was taking place, Benningsen, realizing that he would not be able to gain the decisive victory that he hoped for, appealed for help to Kutuzov. And Kutuzov um, snubs him. Um, you know, he's, you know, ben Benningsen sends a message saying, you know, beg the marshal to give no time to the enemy to rally or make new disposition. And Kutuzov, in the words of uh, Wilson, uh, British commissioner Robert Wilson says, he coldly checked this order. Um, it is an unusual decision on the part of Kutuzov, unless we again think of his grand strategy, that he is not convinced that confronting Napoleon at this time is, is, is opportune. During the battle, he receives the intelligence, which was later proven wrong, that there were strong, this is an intelligence kind of quote, strong reinforcements, French reinforcements coming, and he thinks that Napoleon coming from Moscow. Uh, and so he was disinclined uh, to fight, and so ultimately he refuses to, com uh, to commit the reserves. And even though Murat is defeated, uh, in, in, in the words of one uh, Russian observer, it was an imperfect and unsatisfactory victory. Now, why am I mentioning this, right? And then kind of to refer to your um, uh, question, uh, Tom. After the battle, there is a confrontation between Benningsen uh, uh, and Kutuzov. Kutuzov is then also confronted by other officers, including the British commissioner, um, uh, Sir Robert Wilson. Um, and in this in these conversations that will continue, right, um, Kutuzov demonstrates a very interesting kind of um, opinion, or he manifests this opinion, in which um, he refuses to fight Napoleon until he, Russians have all the advantages secured on, on their side. Uh, when Napoleon decides after Torutino to retreat, right, once he starts retreating, right, and, and Kutuzov confronts him at Maloroslavets, 
you have another kind of in the side, you know, uh, tactically French success, strategically Russian success, the battle that forced Napoleon to turn back and retreat uh, along the route that he came. Uh, well, Nepo uh, Kutuzov doesn't pursue him. And uh, that actually infuriates many of his officers, including Wilson. Uh, and when they confront Nepo uh, Kutuzov about this, um, Kutuzov actually says that there is no reason why we should commit our forces, uh, uh, suffer additional losses, uh, to achieve a victory that, as far as Kutuzov is concerned, is already guaranteed. The fact that Napoleon is retreating with a weakened army, less than 100,000 men now, means that we have won. And now we need to think of a larger picture. And this is, I think, a fourth element of this grand strategy that Kutuzov um, uh, kind of em embraces. Uh, it's an a element that uh, is uh, invariably referred to either as a uh, parallel march, because over subsequent weeks, Kutuzov will march parallel to the Napoleon's army, or uh, uh, Kutuzov himself uses a slightly different expression uh, co uh, called a golden bridge. And that is uh, on, during a conversation with Wilson, Robert Wilson, um, Wilson protested very force, forcibly, either forcefully even, um, that Kutuzov was not engaging Napoleon and uh, Kutuzov snapped at him and he, and this is the quote from him, I don't care for your objections. I prefer giving my enemy a pont de or, this is golden bridge, uh, rather than receiving a coupe de collier, uh, a strong shove. And then he went on to reiterate a, a crucial point that Kutuzov was not convinced that, quote, total destruction of Napoleon would benefit Russia. Okay? And in this conversation with, ben, uh, with Wilson, he says that if Napoleonic Empire comes crumbling down, right, who would benefit from it? Who would be the successor of? And he tells Wilson, Napoleon's succession would not fall to Russia or any other continental power, but to the power which already commands the seas and whose domination then will be intolerable. And of course, he means here Britain. And I think this statement offers a very important insight in Kutuzov's decision making in the second half of the war. Right? Contemporary and scholarly opinion has long derided Kutuzov. Uh, for being this sluggish, kind of, you know, a passive. But there was a reason for it. And the reason is that it's not just his poor health. He does suffer from poor health because he's, uh, you know, it's a cold winter. He's already in his 60s and constantly on the march. So, uh, but it is his intellectual, I think, the strategic consideration that uh, he, for him, war was always bound up with political considerations. And war had to reflect a clear policy. It had to reflect grand strategy. Uh, and in many respects, that's what Napoleon lacked in this war. Right? What was the grand strategy that Napoleon had when he went uh, to Russia? Uh, that's a question we, need, we, can, we can debate. But for Kutuzov, right, war has to reflect a clear policy, a, a grand strategy, not the other way around. And this was one of the cornerstones for his own approach. When he became convinced in the fall of 1812 that Napoleon could no longer prevail in the war against Russia. And now he was retreating. So why confront him when Russian geography, Russian topography, Russian climate, and the asymmetrical warfare that he was already, uh, Kutuzov was already waging would ensure that Napoleon would be defeated. So for him, for Kutuzov, larger picture was more important. Not winning yet another battle that will bring him fame, but rather he was preoccupied with the repercussions of Napoleon's defeat. What would happen to the Napoleonic Empire? Would France, if the Napoleonic Empire collapsed, would it remain the source of continued political turmoil? What would be the balance of power in Europe? What would be Russia's place and role in Europe? And most crucially, would Britain exercise its economic preponderance in Europe that will be detrimental to Russia? And uh, in, in the book I write that you know, in, in, in European politics, right, there, there is that famous expression, I think, that was Voltaire's, uh, that big battalions usually, or the, the providence usually favored big battalions. And Kutuzov was now keen on ensuring that Russia had its share. 
And he was looking at Napoleon, weakened Napoleon, as a good counterbalance to the British preponderance in Europe. And he says, repeatedly says, that he's not willing, quote, to sacrifice a single sol Russian soldier, unquote, to achieve the complete destruction of Napoleon, because it will not be of interest, of, uh, of Russian interest. Uh, when he had a yet another argument with Benningson, who urged this more forceful prosecution of the war, um, uh, Kutuzov says, uh, we'll never come to agreement, right? You're taking British side, while as far as I'm concerned, if that island, this is British island, if that, if that island sank to the bottom of the sea, I wouldn't feel even the smallest regret. So let's maybe go to the quick Q&A. Thank you so much. I want to um, point out just before I turn to some questions, um, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> So we'll, we'll do our best to get through as many of them. I tried to kind of group some of them together a little bit, um, but uh, there are also lots of comments flowing in. People really enjoyed this. So, so thank you very much before we, before we continue. It's, uh, it's really been fascinating. Um, I wanted to turn to, um, we had a few questions that related to um, the pre-campaign Russian troops, uh, both the quality and the quantity, which you, you kind of touched on, uh, but I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit. Before the campaign, um, what was the quality of the Russian troops? Were they were they reliable troops? Were they, uh, you know, um, you sort of talked about the rebuilding of the camps, but but before the campaign, what what was their quality? Uh, and Chris, do you want me to have the uh, show, uh, slides on or should I close? Uh, yeah, you can close your slides if you like, and then okay. uh, we'll uh, just, just have, in, in order have to answer, um, we might use this map. Um, the Russian army was the qualitatively; it was a good, it it it, it was a, a strong, good army, well prepared, um, and we can see the uh, the Russian level of preparations in in the battles that were fought. For example, at Ostrovno, at Mir, at Romanova, at Krasny, the first battle at Krasny. These are, um, you know, battles where Russians steadfastly contested the ground. I mean, think about Krasny. At Krasny, a small division led by General Neverovsky was able to contain the, uh, the French advance guard. Uh, and even though they lost uh, more than half of their men, they, they didn't break, they didn't rout, and in fact organized a fighting retreat. Uh, 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 and we see similar... Um, you know, res res similar results, similar commitments, similar elan, what you know, the French call, uh, demonstrated time and again. I mean, look at Borodino, right? This is the army that has been retreating for weeks, and at Borodino, we have a, a, a carnage that claims uh, well over 75,000 men on both sides, and, and yet the army still remains. So I think qualitatively, uh, I don't have an issue with it, especially uh, bear in mind, this is an army that was reorganized in the wake of defeats at Austerlitz. For example, after Austerlitz, you have a structural reform of our artillery. In the wake of Friedland, you have structural reforms in the uh, in infantry and, and the army as a whole. So, for example, Russian army developed a, a core structure, right, in, uh, which was in many respects borrowed by, from the French. So there are improvements that the Russians have made in in the in the intervening years from uh, Friedland to 1812, um, it's not it's not the quality as such that is issue here, uh, uh, but rather, as I indicated at the beginning of the presentation, it's the quantity, right? The sheer numbers that Napoleon brings are staggering, right? Uh, and and the second is this nebulousness of the planning, that the planning was never f really finalized. It was never communicated clearly. So you have, as I uh, talked, many generals who were unclear what to do. I mean, if you have the commander of the second largest army unaware of what exactly will be happening, that's a big problem. Okay, And that, I think, is the problem that is squarely on the shoulders of the Tsar. Right? Because Tsar is involved in, this in, in these discussions. Uh, and, and, and oftentimes, when the war began, he intervenes, interjects in the military operations, uh, directing, for example, Bagration to 
uh, you know, uh, to attempt counterattack when Bagration is no in, in no position to do so. And so th uh, this is where the problem is, really. Right. So uh, that's a nice segue. Um, turning back to the the quantity of, of the troops, um, why why were they so outnumbered? Did, did Russia have other commitments? Um, I mean, really a two to one. Um, when we think about the size of Russia, we we really picture a much larger army. So so why were they so significantly outnumbered? Um, the, Russia does have other commitments. So they have commitments in Finland. They have commitments in uh, the Nubian principalities. There are some uh, over 60,000 troops actually in the Nubian principalities. Now they will come up in, in late fall uh, and they will try to intercept Napoleon and Berezina, as, as your listeners know. There are commitments in the Caucasus uh, where Russia is waging a war against Ottomans and uh, Persians. Um, so Russian imperial commitments are quite significant. Uh, it is also true that the Russian resources are not as large as Napoleon's. Think about the Napoleon controls virtually all of Europe. Right? Napoleon's Grand Armée can marshal resources from Italy, Germany, uh, can marshal resources from Spain, right, as you all know. Uh, Spanish regiments participated, even Portuguese regiment was in the Grand Armée. There were uh, regiments from Croatia, right, Illyria, Dalmatia, uh, not to mention from Poland uh, and German states. So this is significant resources Napoleon has um, uh, that, that gave him that advantage. And uh, uh, during the 1812 campaign, the Russian government will issue three levies for recruits, and they will raise hundreds of thousands of men. But they need to be trained, right? They need to be prepared. So it will be only in the second half of 1813 that, that uh, those troops will be uh, coming in and joining and sustaining Russian war effort in, in Germany. Right. And uh, picking up on that theme, um, what about um, uh, resources beyond men? Um, did, did Russia have the capacity, um, sort of a military industrial? capacity to um, support that large of an army long term? Um, yes, uh, in fact, uh, one of the reasons, so when we talked about that maneuver, right, uh, when Kutuzov went and positioned himself here, right, well, actually right here first, and then he moves in positions here, uh, that is because uh, here's this Kaluga, right, and Kaluga leads to the southern provinces that were unaffected of the war, and it's not just the uh, kind of supplies, grain, and you know, food, but it's also military industrial complex is uh, located here in, in, in places like Bransk, Tula, where Russian uh, weapon manufacturing is located. And it was this maneuver was designed to prevent the French from reaching and, and jeopardizing it. Uh, because, uh, and so that, that becomes a, an important element in, 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 in the success of the Russian war. Uh, the British do promise to deliver uh, weapons uh, to uh, to the Russians, but ultimately the uh, weapon deliveries from Britain are both numerically inferior and qualitatively uh, uh, not w what the Russians expected. In fact, there is a, uh, a long complaint from the Russians that the muskets that the British delivered were not of, uh, of, of the quality that the Russians expected. Um, so, uh, but nonetheless, there, there, there was uh, British support, which is, we know Br uh, British controlled the Baltic Sea, so they could deliver supplies uh, through the coastline uh, like this. Um, so just uh, um, a couple more, if it, uh, one more quick one, if, if I can, and then, and then maybe a, a conclusive one, if that's all right. Um, so Kutasov, Obviously, his illness um, sort of uh, certainly affects the next year. I believe he, he dies the following year. Um, was there any evidence that that was affecting him in this campaign? Um, you mean the illness? Yes, exactly. Um, uh, yes, we know that he, uh, in, in, through the, that winter, um, you know, this is November, uh, November, December, you know, I've read all his letters that you know, I could lay hands on. And he does complain consistently of 
uh, of not feeling well, of being tired. Um, but he slightly recovers in the early spring of 1813. And then there is, when they are in Germany, uh, um, or to be precise, uh, in, in, in um, passing through Silesia, the, uh, you know, there are people coming out into streets and kind of greeting him and, you know, flowers and, you know, kind of celebrations. And at one point he uh, uh, stopped the carriage and he was uh, dressed lightly, at least. That's what one of his ADC, AD Camps notes. And the cold, you know, there was a cold weather and he caught, you know, he felt this shiver. He, he said, you know, this, uh, he, and right away, that, right after he took the flowers and kind of talked to the people, he turned to this... Uh, 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 ADC and he told him that you know I felt this shiver Do you, can you can you give me something an you know, alcoholic to drink and you know, to fortify myself and I think that was the crucial one so he was already weak and, and tired from the winter you know from the winter of 1813 but that cold streak in the spring of 1813 I think is the one that is what did him in uh, even though Alexander the Tsar sent his personal doctor and even Frederick uh, Willem, uh, of King of Prussia, also sent some of the best physicians. Uh, they were really unable to contain the uh, the inflammation that spread through his body, and ultimately he dies in in April of uh, of 1813. Uh, uh, his death actually was concealed from the army, because Kutuzov was not convinced that marching so far west is advisable considering that Napoleon was rebuilding his forces and again the kind of grand strategy uh, do we really want Napoleon to be uh, completely defeated and out of power uh, and he warned he warned actually in one of the letters he has this wonderful uh, passage when he says you know right, if we move too fast we'll get our nose blooded and he dies right in April and then we have uh, just a couple of weeks later the battles of Bautzen, Lutzen right and uh, Tsar does get his blo uh, uh, nose blooded uh, but the army was not informed of the death of Kutuzov. It kept secret so as not to kind of dampen the spirit. And it will be only revealed in late May uh, um, uh, when, when the battles already are uh, fought. And, and to conclude, uh, picking up on that point, um, we had a, several questions, sort of hypothetical questions or, or what if questions, but I'm just going to leave you with one. Uh, picking up from that point, would the campaigns of 1813 and 1814 have been different? Would he have influenced them differently if he had have survived? How would they how would they have been different if you can if you can speculate? Um, no, it, they would not have been different. And I, I have a good answer for that. <laughs> Actually, a clear answer to that, because the relations between the Tsar and Kutuzov was difficult, uh, complex. Um, uh, um, and, and it goes way back. And in the book, I, I, I discuss in great detail. Uh, in 1812, um, Alexander chose Kutuzov not because he wanted as such, but because he felt the public expected him. He famously says, I wash my hands off of it. Whatever happens, happens. Um, but then, you know, Kutuzov effectively turns the, you know, he, he, he emerges as this triumphant right victor and all. But the relations uh, with the Tsar was always fr uh, frosty. And in Vilna, in December uh, of 1812, when Kutuzov and Alexander meet, uh, uh, ostensibly this is kind of jovial. They c congratulate them, you know, each other. Uh, um, Alexander actually gives Kutuzov uh, hi the highest orders. Uh, you know, the, the first, cl the first uh, uh, class of St. George order, making Kutuzov the first uh, uh, ever uh, knight of of the full rank of this of Saint George, so it's a big deal, kind of in Russian uh, Empire. Um, but while acknowledging Kutuzov's role in in winning this war, Azar also moves steadily to remove people that Kutuzov appointed and replace them with his uh, appointees. So. Um, uh, Tsar increasingly is taking charge of, of military affairs and sidelining uh, the field marshal. Uh, so even though Kutuzov urged uh, Alex to uh, Alexander to, for example, uh, delay the invasion of Prussia, 
right? He's, he, he, he warns uh, both of, of, of nose being bloodied, but also the fact that Russian army is tired, right? We, all, we usually focus on the destruction of the Grand Armée and the other misery of the retreat, but think what it was like for the you know, Russians. They are not immune to that cold or the misery. And I mean, there is a lot of Russian memoirs that show you, and I've published an anthology of Russian memoirs showing how miserable it was for the Russians to, you know, to be engaged in this. Uh, and so Kutuzov was worried about it, but he was overruled. And I think it, it underscores that increasingly he becomes a figurehead. Um, the, the Treaty of Kalish, which is signed in the early 1813, um, creates the Russo-Prussian alliance, it creates this combined Russo-Prussian army, and Kutuzov is appointed as a supreme commander of it, but everyone understands that he is there uh, without formal authority because Tsar is also present. And it is the Tsar that is a great driving force behind the campaigns against Napoleon. And so I, I think 1813 certainly would have played out um, uh, in, in the sense that Tsar would have pushed for fighting, confronting Napoleon. Um, it's the outcome of those battles that I, it will be interesting to consider, right? The kind of tactical, operational outcome. Would Kutuzov have been um, his usual kind of methodical, cautious self and not allowed, like Wittgenstein did, to, uh, to, to get himself trapped at Lutzen, the Bautzen, right? What would have been there on the battle? That's the, that's the hypothetical that is keen, kind of interesting to explore. But otherwise, in terms of strategy, uh, Tsar was firmly in charge, and Kutuzov was um, on, on the way out. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I, I have to apologize. We, we, like I say, we had a large list of questions, and and I got to as many as I could. Um, so I have to apologize to anybody that I, if I didn't get to your question. Uh, I'm, I apologize for just uh, lack of lack of time, but. Um, I do want to say thank you so much. This was uh, a fascinating talk and I really appreciate you joining us here today. Tom? Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I, I want to thank Tom, you and Chris uh, for managing it all. And thank you for the audience for sticking around, asking great questions. Um, and I hope uh, you will enjoy reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm certainly looking forward to it. It's, uh, it's, it's, the the global history is a great read and, and i'm really looking forward to learning more about uh, kutsov here so uh thank you really appreciate this uh great feedback and and for our audience thank you for joining us for so many of these talks uh, we'll be back with more live presentations in the fall but we got lots of content on the channel to check out in the interim and uh, we look forward to loading up some open mic videos as we record those and accumulate them